Good evening, everyone, and welcome to UCLA Anderson School of Management. What a marvelous night this is. We uh, have a room that is just filled to the brim with energy and curiosity. We have students, alumni, and faculty alongside many friends from the Los Angeles community, and we're all just eagerly awaiting to hear from one of the most brilliant minds in finance. My name is Lori Santikin. I am a professor of finance and strategy here at Anderson. I also have the distinct honor of serving as the faculty director of our Fink Center for Finance and Investments, which is endowed by UCLA's very own Larry Fink. Um, on behalf of the Fink Center, the Office of Alumni Relations, and the entire UCLA Anderson family, I'm thrilled to welcome you to campus for this very special event. I also want to extend a very warm welcome to our alumni chapters in San Francisco and Seattle. We can't see them, but they are joining us by live stream as part of Worldwide Welcome Weeks. This is a truly fantastic series of programs that our alumni office hosts around the globe every year. Tonight's event in many ways epitomizes the Fink Center's mission, to bridge the academic study of finance with insights deep from the trenches of practice, to train our students in cutting edge skills and broaden the network of people and ideas to which they're exposed to inspire our alumni to remain lifelong students. And as in this room, to join the Anderson family together with the professional finance community for stimulating discussions on topical issues in finance and business. So in a few minutes, we will observe and participate in one such discussion between two giants in their own right. So let me start with Dean Al Osborne. He's our moderator for the evening. If you've engaged with UCLA Anderson in any capacity during the last 45 years or so, uh, Al Osborne's infectious energy has no doubt inspired you. Al wears his pride, on, uh, his pride for the school on his sleeve, or rather on his hats, and his socks and his ties. And these days he wears quite a few hats for the school. In addition to being a professor of global economics and management, he is the founding faculty director of the Price Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation and has long served as senior associate dean for external affairs. Most recently, he became the interim dean of UCLA Anderson. He joined UCLA after earning four degrees from Stanford University, including a PhD in business economics and an MBA in finance. We are tremendously grateful for his service to the school and for joining us here tonight. Howard Marks is the reason this event has a wait list. He is co-chairman and co-founder of Oak Tree Capital Management, a leading investment manager with more than $120 billion in assets. He holds a bachelor's degree in economics from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania and an MBA in accounting and marketing from the Booth School at the University of Chicago. When Howard Marks speaks, everyone listens. He's known for his memos to clients that become required reading material really for all leaders in finance. Warren Buffett, for example, has said, when I see memos from Howard Marks in my mail, they're the first thing I open and read. I always learn something. At UCLA Anderson, we're thrilled to host one of the first stops on Howard's national tour for his new book, Mastering the Market Cycle, Getting the Odds on Your Side. Ray Dalio calls it a must read. And according to Charlie Munger, it tells us how to learn from history and thus get a better idea of what the future holds. So everyone, get comfortable in your seats and get ready to learn to master the market cycle from the master himself. Please join me in welcoming Howard Marks and Al Osborne. Well, Laurie, thank you for uh, those inspiring remarks. Um, I didn't quite believe that I've been around here that long, and now it becomes real. <laughs> I think I've, man, I've known you almost that long <laughs> as well. So it seems. <laughs> uh, thank you for being with us. My uh, pleasure. This Very evening. glad to be here. It, um, we've been privileged to have done this once before, right, right. and where the conversation was with the one and only Charlie Munger, right. who has been a real part, I think, of sort of you, you developing perspective right. uh, in uh, your yeah. investments. There's a lot of things we could talk about. Uh, 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 Howard, but I want to really just start with a couple of things that I think are fundamental to how you look at the world. And could you tell me a little bit about how you were able to think and synthesize uh, your perspective on markets and, and how they work? Well, I, I think, Al, it's extremely important to, uh, the word is synthesize, and you have to have something to synthesize, mm -hmm. which means that you have to have 
a large number of diverse inputs. And uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not enough to have some exposure to some things. Uh, you, you should always worry about the things you haven't had exposure to. So I think that reading broadly mm -hmm. is extremely important. Uh, and then, of course, I think it's, it's, it's essential to exchange ideas with others. Uh, I happen not to like solitary uh, activities as much. And, uh, you know, if you, if you have some colleagues or peers that you respect and you exchange ideas, you, you probably, it's possible for, for both of you to learn. It can be a win-win. And, uh, of course, we, we all have ideas on what we think are, is, is going to happen and what we think we should do about it. It's great to have those ideas challenged and see if they can stand up uh, in, the, in the face of challenge. So exchanging ideas, I think, is, is uh, extremely important. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, uh, you know, thinking broadly. And um, we, we, we have to, uh, you know, really challenge every day. Now, you know, uh, uh, I write these memos. I, I started 29 years ago. And uh, when I write the memos and wh when I write the, the books, you know, invariably, I think of something in the process that I hadn't thought of before. It's not, like, yes, it's, it's, yeah. it's not like, uh, it's not like create, writing a book consists of trying to get your thoughts on paper. When you write the book, you get new thoughts. In, the, in this book, for example, uh, I had an outline when I started to write, of course, and uh, I thought I'd write about the economic cycle and the profit cycle and the, and the, the, the cycle in psychology. And then I realized that there was a chapter missing uh, that deserved its own chapter, and that was the cycle in attitudes towards risk. When people are cavalier toward risk and happy with risk and embrace risk, then by definition, at prices go high because there is no concern or caution. And then when the, when the cycle turns down and they uh, become allergic to risk, uh, they generally sell without regard to price at prices that are far too low. So the, 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 and the cycle in risk is enormously influential and determinative. I hadn't thought I'd have it in there. I put it in. So I think that you know, writing is, is important and to, to get more ideas. And then lastly, I would recommend strongly that you live a long time and you, and you, <laughs> you, get experience. And, and you experience a lot of markets and a lot of cycles. Uh, and, uh, because if, if you don't experience it, then you have to only, you can only learn about it by reading or speaking with others. Mm -hmm. uh, it, there's nothing like experiencing it first time. Mm -hmm. And you know, one of the things I, I believe strongly is that experience is what you got when you didn't get what you wanted. Uh, <laughs> we learn a lot from tough times and, and from failure. And we learn relatively little from success. Right. You put money in the market, it goes up. What have you learned? You've learned, number one, it's easy. Number two, risk-bearing pays. Number three, there's nothing to worry about. And those are horrible lessons. And, and uh, you know, you, you learn much more uh, fr from, uh, from difficult times than from success. And I guess you sort of have to know what's knowable uh, in that context. Yeah. And um, success on the market, as I read your book, requires an ability, if you master the cycles, as we talk about, yes to develop patterns. Yes. Could you talk a little bit about how you think about this pattern recognition sure. Sure. Uh, idea? Yeah, we go through ups and downs. And the question is, are they random, inconsistent, and therefore not studyable? Or are there patterns that recur that we can learn to recognize? And uh, uh, Laurie, we, Oh, Laurie mentioned Ray Dalio uh, had some nice words for my book. Well, I have some nice words for his. He put out a book earlier this year called Principles, and he talks about how they work at Bridgeport, and he says that you know, they've, they've studied so long, and they have so much experience, and they've recorded so much experience, that they, look, they see something happen, and they say, oh, that's one of those. And saying that's one of those is a hell of a lot easier mm -hmm. than saying, I don't know. I, I, I have no idea what's going on. I've never seen one like this before. I have no idea what's going to happen next and, uh, and, and, or, and what I should do about it. And so I think that 
if there are patterns, we should recognize them. If we try to impose patterns in an area where there are no patterns, then that's folly. But, but I think that in, in the uh, financial and the investment world, there are patterns. Uh, the, one of the main ideas that pervades the book is a quote attributed to Mark Twain. Uh, History does not repeat itself, but it does rhyme. <laughs> and uh, in, in every cycle, compared to the last one, the amplitude of the fluctuations is different. The speed of the fluctuations is different. The duration of the cycle is different. The immediate causes are different, and the effects are different. And one of the things that happens a lot nowadays, especially since, you know, when I talk about the book, is people say to me, well, which cycle is this one like? And the answer is it has some similarities to 07 and some similarities to 82, and, and, uh, and, but, in, but there are also ways in which it's different. But it's very, very helpful to identify uh, similarities. And uh, you know, along the lines of Mark Twain, even though the details are different of every cycle, I conclude in the book that in every boom I've lived through, and I've probably lived through about a half a dozen booms in the market, um, there have been some common threads. There have been things that do rhyme, to use Twain's word. So every boom that I have seen has been characterized by too much optimism, too little risk aversion, and too much money in the hands of people who are too eager to spend it. And if you think about it, excess optimism, dearth of risk aversion, too much money, is a very good formula for a bubble. You can easily see how those things would lead to a boom. And if you think about it for a minute, you can see how hard it would be for a boom to take place without them. So if that's true, if those are common themes that do rhyme, then we know that we can help ourselves by watching out for those. Mm -hmm. And when we see the, the three ingredients, we can do something about it. You know, um, in your book, when you talk about mastering the, the cycles, which is this ability to recognize patterns and know when they come back, which you develop over years of understanding, you did mention that it's important to know your positioning. Yeah. That is, to have sure. a good sense of sort of where you're at. Mm. Could you talk mm. a little bit about how uh, you think about that? Sure. Well, first of all, what everybody wants to know is what's going to happen tomorrow. Mark was down 800 yesterday, 550 today. What's going to happen tomorrow? What's going to happen over the next year, over the next three years? And the answer is nobody knows. And uh, I don't believe in forecasts. Another one of my heroes, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, said we have two kinds of forecasters, the ones who don't know and the ones who don't know they don't know. <laughs> and uh, I am firmly in the first camp. I don't know what's going to happen in the future. And uh, what I say is we never know where we're going, but we sure as hell ought to know where we are. It may be challenging to predict the future. It shouldn't be that hard to predict the present. And if we can, as, if, if we can think in terms of a, a normal trend line, perhaps, for the market, or a, 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 a level which represents fair value, and then the fact that the market oscillates around it, then clearly it's very important to know where in that oscillating pattern we are. Because if this is fair value, and we're here, then clearly the expected value, or the expected performance, from here should be lower than the historic average. The historic average was compiled by buying at prices all along the cycle, but clearly if we're at the peak of a cycle, our prospective return is lower than historically it has been on average, and it's harder to make money than it historically has been, and easier to lose money. Whereas if we're buying here, when prices are depressed, then the expected value is higher than the historic average, and it's easier to make money and harder to lose. So it makes a profound difference, and I think it's extremely important that we figure it out. We don't know where we're going, but where we are has implications for where we're probably going eventually. Now, the word eventually is very important, because if I tell you we're over, that, the, that the market is high in its cycle and is overpriced, 
one of the most important things for you to realize is that overpriced and going down tomorrow are not synonymous. And so if you think about the market fluctuating this way around fair value, then when it goes above the line, it's overpriced. When it goes higher, it's more overpriced. Higher, more overpriced. And markets which are overpriced tend to become more overpriced before eventually they reach a top and turn down. So it, it's, it's a big mistake to think that overpriced and going down tomorrow are synonymous. You can, you can say that that's overpriced, you can sell it, and it goes up another 20%. You feel like an idiot, and, and you get fired by half your clients, <laughs> um, but that doesn't mean that it was wrong. And, and uh, it, it's, I'm straying a little bit from your question. No, but, but that's okay, I'll, I'll bring it back to okay. a couple of things. But, but <laughs> you know, all you can do in this world is do what's right. You can't necessarily do what's gonna work tomorrow. I, when I started at Wharton 55 years ago this month, mm -hmm. and the first lesson I remember learning at Wharton was that you can't tell the quality of a decision from the outcome. Now this is a counterintuitive and in fact perplexing. And most people who, who are not analytical or insightful would say, well, of course you can. Good decisions work, bad decisions fail. But the truth of the matter is that in the world, there are a lot of things that are unpredictable and random. And as a result, good decisions fail all the time and bad decisions succeed all the time. And we all know people, we say, oh, he, he was right for the wrong reason. Mm -hmm. or he was lucky, or he was unlucky. Mm -hmm. and, and so you, 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 can't, you can't think of the world as a place where good decision, good outcome. Bad decision, bad outcome. It doesn't work that way. You know, Richard Feynman, the physicist, said that physics would be much harder if electrons had feelings. <laughs> and the truth is that markets, there is no such thing as a market. There's no place. It might be a building or it might be virtual. What is a market? It's a bunch of people who buy and sell. Mm -hmm. And those people do have feelings. And so they don't always act in a way which is predictable. They don't always act in a way which is right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they do things which are counterintuitive. To predict the movement of the market, then, at the time when people do things which are unpredictable, you have to be able to predict it, which by definition you can't. Which is a... <laughs> Which is a good reason why we have the business judgment rule. Yes. Imagine putting these That's people right. together. Uh, so the process and kind of how you came about it is really speaks to the quality, but the outcome, you could be wrong because of a whole bunch of other things. Sure. Uh, we see it all the time here. Well, well if I can take one more minute, the, uh, the next to last, I will. Yes. The next, to last <laughs> the next to last paragraph in the book quotes from Peter Bernstein, who yes. was a great uh, market observer and sage. And he said, um, the future is not ours to know, but it helps to know that being wrong is inevitable and normal, not some terrible tragedy, not some awful failing in reasoning, not even bad luck in most instances. Being wrong comes with the franchise of an activity whose outcome depends on an unknown future. Now, you know, Imagine if you were a baseball player, you have five trips to the plate and you make out on three of them and you kill yourself. The point is that very few, you know, uh, uh, Ted Williams got two hits and every five trips and he was the best in history. Nobody gets sick three out of five or four out of five and it's the same in investing. None of us get it right all the time. All we can do is have a better batting average mm -hmm. than others. If you have a better batting average, then you'll be a superior investor. Well, in baseball, if you bat uh, 333, it's Hall of Fame. You're exactly. So uh, maybe right. the investors out there ought to think about, you lose seven, don't, don't worry about it because yeah. you win three, right? <laughs> uh, you, you, you prompted me to think a little bit about your notion of being aggressive or defensive Mm. Uh, in different kinds of market situations. You, you talk about that as something you right. 
that, that, that governs a lot of how you, could you explain sure. a little bit? Well, I, I really think that the most important single decision for what I call the medium term in investing is whether it to be more aggressive or more defensive at a point in time. Now, I'm not talking about the short term, like the next day, week, or month. And I'm not talking about the long term, like 30 years, when you can ignore the interim fluctuations. I'm talking about two, three, five years. If you're positioning your portfolio today for the next three years, I think the most important question is whether it should be an aggressive portfolio or a defensive portfolio. And it's not stocks versus bonds, high quality versus low quality, growth stocks versus value stocks, US stocks versus foreign stocks, uh, uh, developed world stocks versus emerging yes, stocks, large companies versus small. The most important question is offense or defense. If you have an aggressive portfolio in a period when defense was called for, you'll get chewed up. And it doesn't matter how you answered all those other questions. And if you have a, an, an, a, an aggressive portfolio, at a time when it turns out that aggressiveness was propitious, it doesn't matter how you answer those questions either. You'll be successful. So I really believe that that's the key. Let me talk about it in another direction now. Mm -hmm. I believe that every investor, myself included, every day faces two risks. I call them the twin risks. What are they? The first one is obvious. It's the risk of losing money. The second one is a little more subtle. It's the risk of missing opportunities. And we have to confront these every day. Now, if you say to me, I want to be absolutely sure that I don't lose any money, then I'll say, okay, we'll put you all in T-bills. You can't lose any money, but you miss every opportunity. If you say, I want to be 100% sure I don't miss any of the opportunities, then I say, okay, no T-bills for you. We'll put you all in risk assets, and you will be 100% exposed to the risk of losing money. So you can eliminate one, but it puts you firmly in the crosshairs of the other, or you can compromise on the two. And most people, what do they say? Well, I don't want, I, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, I, I don't want to lose any money. But on the other hand, I don't want to miss all the opportunities. So I'm going to do some of each. I'm going to balance aggressiveness and defensiveness. I'm going to balance worrying about avoiding losing money and worrying about missing opportunities. And that's the right thing to do. All one or all the other makes absolutely no sense. OK, manage the two risks. Balance them. In what proportion? That's the next question. So the way I think about this pr proposition, so in July of, uh, oh, of uh, 17, I wrote a memo advising some caution. And some guy on TV says, that's it. Howard Mark says, it's time to get out. And when I, when I ran into him the next time, I said, there's only two things I would never say. Get out, and it's time. Because <laughs> I, don't, I am never that certain. And the investment world does not permit that level of uncertainty. It's not black or white. And when you go on, on, on the TV shows, as I do sometimes, they want you to say, buy or sell, in or out. But it's not black or white. It's, a, it's how you balance. Mm -hmm. And the way I think about it is there's a speedometer, like on the dashboard of your car. And it goes from zero to 100. And zero is all cash, and 100 is fully invested in risky securities and perhaps using margin or leverage. And the question is, where should you be in between? Now, if you want to invest, and most people say, I want to make some money, so I'm going to invest. And they, they try to think about whether they should buy Apple or Amazon. But they missed a step. The first step that everybody who considers investing should take is to say, from zero to 100, who am I? Given my age, my financial position, my income, my requirements, my dependence, my psyche, 
Should, where should I normally be? If you're young, if you have a great career ahead, if you're making more money than you need, if you have no dependents, and, you have, and if you make a mistake in investing, you have decades more to make it right, then you can be an 80 or a 90. If you're approaching retirement, and you have a, a dependent spouse, and you're not going to be uh, earning your income anymore from your job, and if you are concerned about your ability to live with the, ec the emotional impact of fluctuations, then you might be a 30. So every person should perform serious introspection and figure out where they should be. And th the emotional content is extremely important because the one thing you can't do in investing is you can't do the right thing if, if, if you can't stand the pain. Mm -hmm. And everything that happens emotionally conspires to make us make mistakes. Most people get excited, the better things go, they feel better about stocks, the higher the prices, they tend to buy more when the prices are at high levels, and then when it turns down, they get depressed, and they get sad, and they rue the day they ever bought a stock, and they tend to sell at low prices. That's what most people do. How can we tell that that's what most people do? Because stocks go up, and when they get too high, then they come down. And most people are buying up here. That's what puts them up here. And they're selling down here. That's what puts them down here. So emotion works to our destruction. <laughs> you must figure out whether you can live with the emotional ups and downs. And if you can't, you know, there are things you can do. You can turn your money over to other people to manage. You can, there are ways to put your, your investing on autopilot. Anyway, background. So you, there's a speedometer. It goes from zero to 100. Each one in the audience should figure out normally where they should be. And let's say I conclude that I'm a 75. Next question, where should I be today? Should my portfolio be riskier than my normal portfolio because I think there are great times ahead and, and prices are low and psychology is depressed and I think it's a propitious time to add risk? Or should I have less risk than normal because I think prices are high and optimism is every place, and euphoria, and, and, uh, uh, and, and the, the uh, pendulum of psychology is probably going to swing back towards the midpoint. So I think it's extremely important to figure out where we are in the cycle, and consequently where we should be positioning our portfolio risk-wise relative to our normal position. Boy, that sounds like a lot of discipline, Howard. Uh well, you know, most people to do. I mean, they want to follow the herd, don't they? Well, they want to follow the herd, but the herd is usually wrong. Yeah. And and in investing, there's something called contrarian behavior, and all the great investors are by definition contrarian. In order to have a great investment result, what do you have to do? You have to buy when everybody else is selling and prices are low. You have to get out when everybody's buying and prices are high. You have to avoid the things that everybody loves and has bid up, and you have to buy the things that everybody hates and, and have permitted to drop like a stone. You have to do the opposite. But it's not easy. Be, and Dave Swenson, who runs the endowment at Yale, which is, I think, the best performing endowment in the country over the last 33 years that he's been there, has a, says in his book, that superior investing requires the adoption of uncomfortably idiosyncratic positions. And those two words are fabulous. Because if you want to be a superior investor, even if you want to avoid the, these horrible mistakes that I described, by definition, you must invest differently from the herd. You must invest idiosyncratically. But by definition, idiosyncratic positions are uncomfortable. Why? Because the market's going like this. Every stock is getting more valuable every day. You say it's overpriced. You get out. It continues higher. Everybody else is making money, telling you what an idiot you are to get out. And, you know, there's a book uh, about bubbles and crashes by Charles Kindleberger. He says there is nothing worse for your, dis for your equilibrium than to watch a friend get rich. <laughs> <laughs> That's human nature. And so, and, and, and by the way, so you get out of something, nobody ever identified an asset that was overpriced and got out 
to, only to see it go down the next day. Mm -hmm. it, overpriced assets, general rule, overpriced assets become more overpriced. And you have to be able to live with that. And it's uncomfortable. And there's an old saying in our business that being too far ahead of your time is indistinguishable from being wrong. <laughs> but you have to live with that because there is no alternative. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you know, uh, your words have real power. Uh, last month in one of your letters, you discussed the prospects for the fan companies, mm -hmm. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and so on, and their prices fell. I'm certainly not always right. Okay. And, and uh, you know, uh, I try my best, and some people emulate, and, and uh, I wouldn't recommend it. Okay, I mean, the fangs have gone up and up and up. Yeah, and, I mean, look right. at the multiples but that you they know, have. And you know, I wasn't like in that memo, Al. Yeah. I wasn't saying that the fangs are a bad idea. Okay. What I was saying is that the performance of the fangs, the levitation of the fangs, indicates to me, I had a, a whole list of things in that memo. The, the memo was, came out two weeks ago. It's called uh, The Seven Worst Words in the World. And I had a whole list of things that, to me, were indicative that this market was elevated and thus risky. And the belief in the fangs and the willingness to pay an extremely high and ever-rising price for a company that it makes no money, it's not a mistake, it's not right, it's not wrong, mm -hmm. but clearly it is indicative of the presence of optimism. And I want to know when optimism in the market is riding high. I, and all things being equal, I want to cut my risk posture. And I want to know when pessimism is overarching and all things being equal, I want to increase my risk posture. So that's all, I, I didn't, it, it wasn't, comment about the fangs themselves, and I wasn't telling anybody yeah. to sell the fangs, but I think it's really important that we know what's going on around us. And those seven words that people should know ah, about The seven worst words much. in the world, too much money chasing too few deals. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every once in a while we see this at the height of, of, uh, of cycles when, uh, when money is trying to get into risk asset classes and there's too much money for the deals and uh, people are ignoring risk and riding high on eagerness and, um, and an auction takes place. Every transaction in a marketplace is an auction transaction. Now it's not always obvious, so the Beza Christie's are not at the door, there's nobody with a gavel, there's no announcement, but the truth of the matter is that if, if I come out and I want to sell my General Motors stock in some sense there's bidding and you enter in bid at 32 and you at 32 and an eighth and you at 32 and a quarter you at 33 and an eighth and you don't see each other's bids you know it's not out and outcry but uh, eventually my stock goes to the person who bids the most it's an auction if i want to if i want to borrow money for my company i go to all my banks and they bid one says i need 7% interest, the next one says I'll take six, and the last one is very eager to put out money, so they say I'll take five. And one banker says I need very protective documents, and the second one says I'll give you loose documents, and the third one says I'll give you, f I don't need any protection. And so the one, that bank, that last banker gets to make a 5% loan with no protection. He won the auction, or did he? But when we see the auction getting hot, when there's too much money in the hands of, of uh, would-be suppliers of money and they're too eager to put it out, then the, market, then the auction goes too far. And the price goes too high, which means that the prospective return is too low and the risk is elevated. But and, it's different this time. Well, it's, and there are the four worst words in the world. He's a great, he's a great straight man. The four worst words in the world are it's different this time. And we, I've seen this several times in my life. And what it means is the old risks, the old rules don't apply. So in, uh, in uh, I, I told you that the average PE on a stock, price earnings ratio on a stock since the World War II has been 16. And in 2000, it was 32. And if you said to somebody who was a tech stock aficionado, at that time, well, aren't you scared about the elevated P.E. ratio 
on, on, the, on the stocks. And in fact, there were so many internet and e-commerce stocks that didn't have any earnings and were selling on a multiple of sales if they had sales, but many didn't have sales, and they were selling on a multiple of dreams or of eyeballs or something like that. And, <laughs> and if you said to somebody, what about the, the old rules? Mm -hmm. And they say, no, no, you, you, you're wrong. It's different this time. The old rules don't apply because these, the internet's gonna change the world and history is irrelevant. And guess what? The internet changed the world, but 99% of the stocks disappeared. And it turns out that history did apply. So when you hear somebody say, this time it's different, hold on to your wallet. Well, you know, I remember when many analysts were creating different measures of EBITDA mm, and calling mm. them all kinds of yeah. things. Yeah. Well, uh, now as an effort to justify yeah. Yeah. the elevated PEs. But. Well, th this is this is uh, this is one of the things that going that's going on now. So, um, you know, there are norms. I'm go I don't want to get Al started, but we, there are people who don't believe that we have to hew to the norms, the traditional norms, right? But the, there are norms. And one of the norms, for example, is maybe when, when one company buys each other, another company, they should only use, they should only use uh, six times EBITDA for the, for the amount of debt. So if a company makes uh, $20 million, you might be willing to, to, to use $120 million worth of borrowed money to buy it. And any excess of that over in the price should be in the form of equity, which, which is safer. And in this memo, uh, The Seven Worst Words in the World, I talk about the fact that I, I detect that that's the condition today. So I went out to my Oak Tree uh, colleagues and I said, give me nominees for dumb deals. Because when dumb deals can get done easily, that's indicative of the fact that the world is a buoyant, euphoric place and that's dangerous. And so, you know, they sent me things where, well, here's a company that just issued debt and they issued, the debt is seven and a half times EBITDA, but it's now seven and a half times something called adjusted EBITDA. And adjusted EBITDA is the money they would have made if things would have been different. <laughs> or, And or, a theoretical multiple analysis, which adds right. back marketing expenses exactly. when you don't have to pay them. <laughs> exactly. so, so for example, what you say is, well, this company made $20 million and this company made $20 million, but if you put it together, they're, together they're gonna to make $60 million because of economies. So you have adjusted EBITDA, and, and there, there were, I gave the example of companies whose e adjusted EBITDA was 150 and 200% of their reported EBITDA, but in a buoyant, risk-tolerant, unconcerned market, people will ignore the old norms and, and, and lend against dreams. And the whole point of the book is that when that's the case, you want to know it and act accordingly. And that's really very good. I, I could go on all evening with you, Howard, as you know. Uh, and I want to get to some questions, but I believe that here we are at the Anderson School. You were at Chicago at a very important time mm -hmm. in financial mm -hmm. history. Yeah. Uh, when uh, Fama, Fisher, Jensen, and Roll were there. And uh, you may want to make a comment about that. Uh, sure. I got about two or three minutes before I get the hook. Okay. And I know you're a great philanthropist. Uh, and you're very important in, in doing a bunch of things, not only for the schools where you went to, uh, but the city of New York. Sure. And so maybe take a minute to talk to each of those if sure. you can. Well, uh, um, you know, look, Cicero, the philosopher, said that the thankful heart is not only the greatest of all the virtues, but it is the parent of all the other virtues. And I think you... We all have a lot to be thankful for, and, and if we're not thankful for it, then we're really stupid. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I have been incredibly lucky in my life, and one of the ways I was lucky, one of the minor ways I was lucky, was getting to University of Chicago in 1967, and the people that Al uh, mentioned, who were the, the, really the pillars of finance theory, mm -hmm. had developed the main theory at Chicago in 62-34. So that means when I got there in 67, I was in, the, in the, one of the very first classes to learn that stuff. And that was good luck, and I appreciate that. And among other things, that has caused me to want to get back to Chicago. And so, you know, uh, I, I've given them some contribution, endowed some, some uh, uh, fellowships, uh, fellowships for, and, uh, uh, and, and primarily directed at 
students from California. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know, um, I, I think that our lives are less than they should be if we are not appreciative of our good fortune. Because we should, I mean, and I wrote this memo back in January 14 called Getting Lucky. And I talked about how lucky I've been. And I say in there that, you know, I could, I could take the approach that, no, no, I haven't been lucky. It's been all my skill and my hard work. And, um, and because, you know, some people might feel that if they attribute some of their success to luck, that they've been diminished. I think, whoopee. <laughs> I feel so great about having mm -hmm. been lucky. And it makes me very optimistic because as irrational as it may be, I think I'm going to keep being lucky. Mm -hmm. And it makes me feel really good. And it makes me feel like I want to give back. And philanthropic, and, and you have and, been very generous. And, yeah, and, 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 and there's, there's nothing like it. The book is Mastering the Market Cycle, but the key words are getting the odds on your side. Right. Uh, we've had a conversation with Howard Marks, uh, one of the great investors of our day, with some good homespun uh, thinking that will be useful to any of you all who want to go out and do the right thing. Howard, thank you very much well. for being a part of this evening. We really appreciate it. You're terrific. Thank you. Uh, now we want to open this up to some questions. OK, we see some, some movement. A uh, little cycle here. I'll start it. My name is Ivan Gaidarov, a public company treasurer. Howard, you've been speaking about uh, defensive and aggressive portfolios. It, what is your definition of a defensive portfolio, for example? Okay, thanks for asking that. Most people think that defensive means you sell and raise cash, and aggressive means you put cash to work. But the truth of the matter is that anything you want to do in the investment business, you can do aggressively or defensively. And there are so many ways to be uh, uh, aggressive or defensive. For example, one of the things that I and historically and Oak Tree have worked in is high yield bonds, so-called junk bonds. And you might say, well, bo junk bonds are aggressive. But if you want to have some junk bonds, there are defensive ways to do it. You can have companies with higher ratings, companies that are larger, larger companies with critical mass tend to, tend to survive better. Uh, you can invest in companies that are in so-called defensive uh, industries like food, people don't stop eating, uh, et cetera, or, as opposed to uh, aggressive industries like uh, movies where you know, sometimes people do stop going to movies. Uh, you, can, you can put your money in a mutual fund run by somebody who has a history of doing great in bad markets and not so great in good ones, as opposed to people who are, have a history of doing great in good markets and not so well in bad ones. So th there are many things you can do. Uh, if you want to be aggressive, you can go into funds that use leverage. If you want to be defensive, you would not use leverage. Uh, there are ETFs now. You can buy an ETF which, which will go up or down twice as much as the S&P, three times as much, four times as much. So you can actually dial your risk. And, and, uh, and there are many ways, especially through uh, ETFs and other forms of derivatives and fan financial engineering, you can, you can have as risky or as safe a position as you want to have without going to cash. Hi, Howard. Thank you for your time today. I had the fortune to intern for Oak Tree in the summer of 17, and since then I've really enjoyed reading your memos and learning more about you. I was wondering, what do you think about the current rising interest rate environment and how it bodes for the bond management industry, specifically here in Southern California? Sure. The most important thing to know about interest rates is for the last 10 years, they have been unnaturally low. And, you know, when, when the central bank lowers interest rates, it tends to stimulate the economy. More people can afford a mortgage and buy a house. More people can afford a car. Manufacturers can borrow money and put up factories. And in every way, low interest rates are stimulative. And the central banks of the world cut interest rates essentially to zero, sometimes negative, uh, uh, 10 years ago in order to pull the world out of the global financial crisis. Now, the, the central banks outside the U.S. did it later than the U.S. That's one of the reasons why we've had a much better recovery here than they have. 
But anyway, uh, the point is, so the first point is interest rates have been unnaturally low. Number two, most people come to Booth School, most people maybe are here tonight, because they believe in the free market system. And most people believe that the free market system, better known as the capitalist system or free enterprise, is the best allocator of resources. And, you know, business tends to put its capital and its workers and its, and its expertise in areas uh, which, where they will be the most productive. And uh, I, I believe that very strongly. Uh, you, try to find me the countries where the government does the allocating which have been successful. You won't have much success. Free markets allocate resources. We haven't had a free market in money for 10 years. The price of money has been administered and controlled and artificially suppressed, not allowed to roam free in response to supply and demand. I think that the Fed wants to get out of that business. And if they, I mean, anybody with a brain who's an economist would want to get out of that business. And you know, uh, 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 Bernanke started, uh, Geithner started talking, no, Bernanke started talking about it um, close to five years ago, and in the last few years, it's been happening, and there have been eight interest rate increases so far, and most people think there'll be about five or six more in the current series, and when interest rates are A, artificially low, and B, freed up, and especially C, when the economy is prosperous and there's a demand for capital, you should expect to see the price of money rise. It has been rising. It probably will continue to rise. Uh, uh, not terribly far. You know, I've seen interest rates of, uh, I have a, a, a slip on my wall from when I had a loan outstanding from a bank at 22 and three quarter percent. And I don't see, think we're going to see that again. And I, yeah. you know, back, back in uh, 06, 07, I had a lot of money in five year treasuries at six and a half percent. I'm not even thinking we're going to see that again. But today, the five year treasuries is in the twos, mm -hmm. and I think that's going to rise, and I think it should. Now, the problem is, my partner, Sheldon Stone, uh, goes around doing this all day. <laughs> what does this mean? Interest rates up, bond prices down. Interest rates down, bond prices up. That's how bonds are priced. When, inter when contemporary interest rates rise, old bonds become worth less, and their prices fall. So, in answer to your question, we're probably going to see rising interest rates, which means we're probably going to see falling bond prices. And, and I think that's inescapable. And interestingly, the, 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 the pain which has been felt in the stock market in the last six trading days is largely attributed to the fact that interest rates have been going up. How can that come as a surprise? You know, <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, as I said, uh, Bernanke signaled it five years ago, and it, he started doing it two to three years ago, and, and how, all of a sudden, last Thursday, everybody, oh, shit, interest rates are going up. I better get out of the stock market. <laughs> Bang! You know? And it, that just goes to show you, you know, that, it, uh, that at the University of Chicago, they said that people are rational and objective calculators of value, and to hell with that. You know, they, they, are, they are emotional and erratic. Okay. So we have this new field in behavioral economics. We're going to go to San Francisco, so stand right there for a second. So how do we get to San Francisco? We have a question from San Francisco. Uh, oh, thank you, Howard Marks, for presenting and talking to us. Can you see me? Yes. <laughs> uh, I'm Chris Abad, a current fully employed MBA student. Uh, and my question centers around with companies or financial companies that invest based on algorithms and how that has affected market cycles. Like, what do you think those market amplitudes have looked like over the recent years? Um, I wrote a memo in June that everybody might want to look. By the way, I, I talk about the memos once in a while. They're all available at www.oaktreecapital.com under the heading of Insights, and the price is right. They're free. And, and uh, you know, there's, there's 29 years worth, so you can keep busy on a winter night. Um, um, so I wrote a memo in June entitled Investing Without People. And it talked about index and passive investing, algorithmic and systematic investment, and uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning. 
And um, so I hope you'll read it for a full treatment uh, of the subjects. But in answer to your specific question, it is not my feeling that these things have uh, elevated the stock market. You know, I think that uh, especially uh, algorithmic, which is your specific question, they're buying and selling every second, every microsecond. So I don't see how they can be s doing enough net buying mm -hmm. to, to put air under stocks. I don't, think, I don't think they are the culprit, Chris. Okay. And Seattle. Oh, yep. Hi. Uh, thank you, Howard. This is James Reagan, class of 92. Hello, Professor Osborne as well. I uh, have a question about debt. Uh, we're seeing uh, record debt levels, both on the federal public side, corporate debt, and household debt as well. How do you view those levels now, and what does it mean for your kind of optimis optimism index and how you look at the markets going forward? Yes. Well, if, if you go back to the memo of two weeks ago, seven worst words in the world, there's an extensive discussion of, of the factors that I think make the world riskier now and, 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 and are indicative of the presence of optimism and uh, eagerness and greed and risk tolerance and credulousness and all these things. And we are much more indebted in many ways than we were in the past. And all things being equal, this adds to the risk. Uh, Again, it, it adds fundamentally to the riskiness of the environment, and it is also indicative of the elevated animal spirits, uh, which are dominant in the market today. Uh, now, uh, the interesting thing, however, is that w the only thing we know is that there is more debt, and all things being Google, that makes the world riskier. But we don't know exactly how much it means. When I was a kid, we used to have there used to be debates about whether it was okay for the government to owe money, whether it was okay for there to be a national debt. Mm -hmm. We seem to have gotten over that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and of course, now we have uh, national debt in the trillions. 20s of trillions, yes. and we seem to still be doing okay. Most people think there is some number out there at which the debt becomes unwise and lethal, but nobody can tell anybody what it is. So uh, uh, I'll just say, we'll, we'll see. We'll see, absolutely. Let's go back to Los Angeles here in UCLA. Okay. Thank you, Howard, for your time and for this wonderful talk. My question is regarding the current environment, taking the temperature as you like to do, um, just seeing what's going on where you see like SoftBank and venture capital mm. raising an enormous amount of money, um, seeing the cryptocurrency uh, phenomenon and seeing similarities to the dot-com, um, seeing private equity raise enormous amounts of money. Right. My question is, all of these signs and with the current valuation of equities, the market cycle, you know, maybe when it, when it turns, will they all link up and will it be a big washout where hedge funds, private equity start withdrawing, venture capital starts disposing Manhattan real estate, starts tipping. How do we know if the cycles will be singular, you know, linking together? I know that's a hard question, yeah. um, but just, you know, just the other day hearing a venture capitalist mention that it's just all one big Ponzi scheme in mm. venture capital. Uh, this was social capital's uh, head. Um, how do you sure. kind of link up the different market cycles with, yeah. with all of what's going on? Well, again, I would refer you to the seven worst words in the world. Right. <laughs> and, and no, I mean, uh, to the memo. Which, which came out two weeks ago on the 26th, September 26th. Mm -hmm. And I touch on all those things there. Soft bank, venture capital, yeah. private equity, real estate, it's all there. Like with Al's question about the fangs, uh, look, the point is, in the 90s, very successful venture capital funds raised 100 or $200 million. And in, I think, fiscal 99 or fiscal 2000, they had a triple digit rate of return. And of course, that makes everybody in heat to put money into venture capital. And in 2000, those firms raised one billion or two billion. Those funds were singularly unsuccessful. Too much capital. Too much money chasing too few deals. Now SoftBank, Japanese firm, is, or has organized most of a hundred billion dollar fund to invest in technology, not necessarily at the venture level, but at all, at all stages of development. But 
I don't think you can put a hundred million dollars, a billion dollars, to work thoughtfully in technology. And one of my friends who is a venture capitalist told me recently that what happens is they go to a younger company and they say, we want to invest $2 billion. They say, well, we, we don't need $2 billion. We can't use $2 billion. And by the way, we don't want to sell 80% of our company. And they say, if you don't take it, we're going to give it to your competitor. He's going to put you out of business. So, you know, now too much money is not only bad for the people whose money it is, but it's bad for whole industries, in my opinion. So this is just indicative of what happens when there's too much money around. And by the way, if SoftBank raises 100, then one of the firms that raised a billion in 2000 can say, we're gonna raise 10 billion. Look how disciplined we are. <laughs> and, you know, this is the process through which markets be, get into trouble. Right. And in, uh, in the memo, The Seven Worst Words in the World, I refer to a memo I wrote in February 07 called The Race to the Bottom. And I discussed this concept of too much money being around and what that does to discipline. And it makes it really hard. And, uh, you know, I can't tell you exactly how this is going to unwind and manifest itself. I can't, but I mean, I tend to think that all of these things that have been elevated on excess money and excess animal spirits will come to earth. That's the way things usually are. Thank you. Uh, and let's take the gentleman with the red tie. That's you. That's you. Okay. I, I figured everyone had red tie yeah. here. <laughs> uh, let's not go there. <laughs> I, I kid. Uh, and you get the last question, so oh. it better be good. Uh, uh, oh, so much pressure. But, uh, Howard, thank you so much. Uh, really terrific uh, hearing from you. And I, I was just curious if you had any insights on managing margin within the market cycle, uh, basically piggybacking on the zero to 100, uh, I guess, risk profile. On managing? Uh, margin. Margin, the use yep. of margin. Yep. Well, you know, look, margin means is now called leverage. It's using borrowed money to supplement your own money to buy more. And uh, the, it should be obvious that leverage never makes an investment a better investment. Mm -hmm. It only amps up its sensi sensitivity. And it in, if, if it's gonna be successful, it increases your gains, and if it's gonna be unsuccessful, it increases your losses. But it doesn't make it better, and it doesn't change the odds of success. If you go to Las Vegas, I like to play blackjack, small stakes but it mathematically, ma mathematically is enjoyable. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Las Vegas, once in a while, the pit boss will walk by and you put down a bet and he'll say, just remember, the more you bet, the more you win when you win. <laughs> and, and you can't argue with that. And that's, <laughs> and that's margin. So obviously, if you are a high risk investor with with financial resources and, and emotional capital and patience, you might think about using margin. Now, I would argue that you shouldn't use margin regardless of where we are in the cycle, but a high-risk investor in a good part of the cycle should consider margin. On the other hand, a low-risk investor, even in a good part of the cycle, probably should not consider margin because his or her financial position and emotional makeup will not permit it to be used wisely. So clearly, margin is one of the things that we can adjust to calibrate our, the riskiness of our portfolio, uh, but I think it has to be used really with, with kid gloves. And in, in doing so, would, would you say that the, the objective would be to, I guess, get out early, or do you just hold on to your hat through the, through the cycles? Well, I mean, it's obviously, well, look, some people consider themselves buy and hold, and some people try to get in and get out. I, th I think the whole, I wouldn't have written the book if I didn't think it, it was a good <laughs> idea to have less risk at the top and more risk at the bottom. So that's the position I would advocate. But if you conclude 
that A, you can live with the interim fluctuations, and B, you're not able to get in at the bottom and out at the top, then I think buy and hold beats the heck out of what most people do, which is buy at the top and sell at the bottom. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I'm Jill Baldoff, class of 81, Associate Dean Alumni Relations, and I want to thank all of you for coming out to share in this really wonderful partnership between the Fink Center and Alumni Relations for Worldwide Welcome Week. We're especially happy to be thinking in the next and welcoming our San Francisco and Seattle chapters. We have a lovely reception set up in the Marian Anderson Courtyard for all of you tonight. To reach it, simply head down any staircase and step outside. There, there will be a table set up where Howard will be signing a few books for those of you who, who purchase books. And if you haven't purchased a book yet, you can also do that outside in the Marian Anderson Courtyard. So thank you again for coming. Go Bruins, go Anderson.